One of my particular bugbears with property investors is that most fail to benchmark the performance of their properties. I get it. There is no accepted industry standard and it's rarely spoken about in property circles. Sure, people can tell you the yield they're getting, but is that even the right metric? And then you come across confident property investment advisors, strategists, researchers, buyers, agents and spruikers who are happy to brag about their successes, but these are often short-term wins, whereas property is a long game. How often do you come across someone who really has the runs on the board, who has been in the game long enough to have amassed evidence of whether or not their advice worked out for their clients? Welcome to The Elephant in the Room. This is the podcast where we love to talk about the big things in property that never usually get talked about. I'm Veronica Morgan, real estate agent, buyer's agent and buyer's agent mentor, co-host of Foxtel's Location, Location, Location Australia, author of Auction Ready and co-host of Your First Home Buyer Guide. And I'm Chris Bates, mortgage broker, recently ranked number five in Australia out of over 18,000 brokers in the annual MPA Top 100 Mortgage Broker Award. Before we get started, I need to let you know that nothing we say here can be taken as personal advice. We always recommend you engage the services of an appropriate and experienced professional. Today, we're interviewing Michael Beresford, who is the Director of Investment Services Open Corp, a business that has been helping property investors for 18 years. And Michael's been introduced to us with some pretty impressive credentials. So today, we want to unpack how he's got to where he is and see whether there are any lessons in that journey for all of us. Welcome, Michael. Hey, Veronica. Thanks for having me. Michael, I think we'll just probably kick off with the, the company chat, really. I mean, Open Corp, tell us a bit more about it, your role there. Yeah, what do you guys do? Yeah, thanks, Chris. Well, it's a great story, actually. There's uh, there's four of us uh, in the, um, uh, four partners in the business. We used to play footy together 25 years ago, um, had a, a shared passion for property and investing. And we found that as we were growing our own portfolios, increasingly our, our family and friends were getting curious about what we were doing. So we kind of got to the point where we thought, well, instead of having coffees, helping our friends on a Saturday afternoon, maybe there are some other people out there that are motivated to, uh, to learn from our experience and, and expertise and, and want everything done for them. And nearly 20 years later, as you say, here's OpenCorp still doing the same thing. So yeah, we feel we've got the, the rest to be down pat for being able to help people you know, change their financial life by building a portfolio. It's not about buying one property and stopping. There are there are a lot of companies over the journey that have, have been transactional in nature like that. But uh, we're in for the long term with clients and, and helping them to uh, you know stay on track to achieve the kind of financial goals that they're after. And we've got you know a number of second generation investors now uh, where yeah mum and dad have done really well and their, their kids are now on the journey with us, uh, which is a really really pleasing part given that we started helping our family. And, and we help everyone from the, the time poor executives through to, you know, the typical mum and dad that just want to improve their situation a bit, um, but not sure where to start. So, I mean, um, I mean, I guess that's what a lot of property companies will probably say. I mean, it's a similar thing, right? We, you know, a lot of people in the, the wealth space say similar things. It's a helping people get ahead financially. But I mean, without sort of giving you complete secrets, just what is the secret source that's want to open corp? Like, what is the, the things that you guys do better than the rest? Like, what is the, the real pitch? Yeah, look, I'd say it's it's two things. Um, <clears throat> the first thing is it's the track record. Like we have our in-house research and analytics team is second to none. Uh, and the way that we measure that is is by how much we've made our clients. So, uh, you know, over the uh, over the last 12 years, we've beaten the market by 25.8%. So um, by having that core metric, we're the only group that measures our, our performance on a quarterly basis. Uh, yeah, and that's what we, uh, we hang our hat on. So... Um, yeah, there's a lot of research and, and data involved in investing well. It's very easy to drive around the corner from where you live and buy a property because it feels yep. comfortable. But we're really um, unpacking for our clients, helping them understand what the right strategy is, why it's right, uh, and then making a personalized recommendation. You know, we're not, uh, we're not a front for a developer. Yep. Uh, we're not selling our own stuff uh, or the, the well-trodden path that, that a lot of companies go down. Um, you know, so having that independence and making sure that we're making the re recommendation based on each client scenario is, uh, is really key. Um, the second point is that our strategy hasn't changed over the journey. So we're not doing a little bit of this and a little bit of that. It's not like one property's in vogue today and next week we'll do something else. Uh, the strategy hasn't changed. We have a passion for in-depth analytics. Um, Matt Lewis and our CEO is one of the, uh, one of the smartest property minds that I've, um, I've ever come across. I love talking property with him and as do our clients. 
you know, when we uh, we give them, you know, consistent updates on how the market's performing and yeah. and, and what they what they need to be aware of. So that's how, that's how we're different. We love what we do, um, and we just like sharing that passion with people that are equally motivated. Uh, we'll go. We'll get to the performance thing. I mean, that's a um, definitely a big claim to outform the markets, and we'll cut into that a bit deeper how that actually is measured and you know against what and etc. But um, and I, I like that your strategy hasn't changed. I mean, a property fundamental should be the same. You know, you're buying. Uh, and we'll talk about, we've all got different beliefs on that, but yep. what are those fundamentals? Like, what is that strategy? Like, let's, if we, what's given you that outperformance, what were you doing that the market wasn't? It's really come from the belief that you don't have to sacrifice either cash flow or capital growth to achieve the other. We believe that you can have the the best of both worlds in that. So look, fundamentally to, to make a demonstrable difference to your financial future, you really need to be um, investing for capital growth because one property is not going to make you wealthy. doesn't matter if it's the best performing property in the history of the world. Uh, one property is not going to get you there to the point where you have the, the flexibility to work part-time in the future or help the kids get into the market or pay your own home off quicker. Um, they're all great outcomes, but to, to achieve those things, you need to be able to build a portfolio and have a process that you can repeat over time. So unless you've got that, that growth component in the properties, uh, then you're not going to actually create the equity that you can use for the next deposit and so on and so forth. We all know that the hardest part of getting into the market today is actually accumulating that first deposit. So it's hard enough to get the first deposit. Imagine trying to save for a second or a third. So the equity creation is really, really key. Yeah. Um, the second part is obviously around the cash flow. And if a property is really expensive to hold, then you're never going to get past one anyway, because it just becomes restrictive on your lifestyle. Um, investing is supposed to be a fun, empowering journey that creates an amazing outcome long term. It's not supposed to be, you know, kind of some financial constraint that that forces you to choose between date night on Friday with your partner and, and building an investment portfolio. So um, by being able to get the best of both worlds, that's how we're able to you know, lather, rinse, repeat the process and, and help people to build portfolios with multiple properties. Um, this is interesting because, of course, it sounds um, very compelling. And um, it's like you've found the secret sauce that no one else has managed to find. So obviously, I know you're probably not going to give it all to us, but we're very curious to know how you found it or where it is. So fundamentally, you're talking a quantity strategy there, right? You, so you're basically saying you need to have multiple properties in order for this to work, but you, you're walking a tightrope between or a fine line between balancing cash flow and balancing capital growth. Um, you're saying you don't need to sacrifice capital growth for cash flow because that's typically been the experience of most um, property investors, but also experts. And so how is it that you've been able to sort of put like a hot knife through butter? You, you've managed to be able to carve out the country to find that. Um, I'm a little skeptical. I'll, I'll be sure. upfront with that. Because also you got, we've got a, an issue with the tighter lending, that the environment that's come in since 2016. Has that sort of stuffed the strategy up at all or you've been still managing to do the same thing? So can you sort of tease it out for us and give us a bit, bit more understanding of this? Yeah, it's a great question, Veronica. Look, I, I think the point here is that building a portfolio is, is a long-term uh, a, a long -term thing, right? We're not trying to accumulate four properties in the first six weeks or, or anything like that. So um, the, the lending market and the, the lending constraints and so forth, that, that they're like interest rates and inflation and capital growth and rental growth and vacancy rates and unemployment rates. There are all these different variables that are consistently moving at some point in time, okay? And the, the one thing that is, um, is sure to happen is that most people get their information from the media and the media have a motivation to sell clicks and sell papers. Now, the reality, as we'll get into the fundamentals, I hope, as part of this discussion, as you mentioned, Chris, we can start to break that down and, and help people to be really informed around where the market's at right now. But yeah, there, there, are, there are some of our clients that have you know, got three or four properties or more that haven't been able to duplicate. So... You know, there, there are different ways and, and looking at their, their total set of resources um, is a way that we can help them there. But at the same time, if you pick the right kind of properties, you don't need a massive portfolio. It's not like, you know, back in the day, Steve McKnight's talking about 100 properties in two weeks or whatever the title of the book was. <laughs> yeah. um, you know, it's three or four, and in some cases two, depending on how long people have got 
with their goal time frame is sufficient to create an amazing outcome. So yeah. I think it's really about understanding. We always say step number one is understand what you want to achieve. You know, when you understand where you want to be, it's very easy to put a plan in place to, to get there over time. Second step is to understand your borrowing capacity. So as you'd be doing, Chris, with clients all the time, you know, reviewing that and tweaking that, when, when you've got the borrowing capacity to be able to buy, that's the time to, to, to buy it. You know, it's because the, the, these criteria will change. Hindsight's a wonderful thing, but we were telling clients, you know, at length in the middle of COVID, now is a great time because interest rates are at record lows and the market will come back. And we even wrote a book, uh, you know, on it. So you can, you can check all the claims, but we, we, all the things that we said would happen did happen. Um, if you were listening to the general media at that point in time, you would have thought the world was going to end and yep. it would be safer to sit still. Now, you know, I, I love saying to people that, that maybe the listeners that are out there with the benefit of hindsight, would you have bought a property 35 years ago? I'm yet to meet someone that says no, right? Yeah. But not every day or every week in that 35 year period is perfect for investing. We've had in that time, negative gearing removed, it's come back, the recession that we had to have, the GFC, the Asian financial crisis where international stock markets lost 60% of their value, like all of these major events, right, that are well, well and truly worse than a bit of inflation and some interest rates rising from record lows, okay? In the grand scheme of things in the long term, focus on the fundamentals, protect your cash flow and make sure you've got buffers, but buy when you can, you know, and very quickly you find over a 10, 15, 20 year period, some amazing results can be achieved. So the way that we've done it is, is, you know, um, being very selective around the areas that we go into, you know, we've got a team of six at open court, uh, in our research and analytics team, um, two of those are valuers. Um, yeah, so they're, they're looking at where can we buy for value around other properties, um, comparable sales that are, that are worth more. And so the secret source is not necessarily a massive secret. It's a strategy that I'm sure a lot of investors look at, but where the biggest mistake investors make is they get emotional about what they buy and every extra dollar that they spend, you know, is growth that they're not seeing and not seeing sooner. So if we can see growth sooner rather than later and allow our clients to get into the next property a bit sooner and you capture more of that growth market and you can get, go again and again and again then, you know, that, that's really, um, I guess where the, the ongoing mentoring we provide can be, can be a big, um, a game changer for our clients. So there's a few things there that I, um, were keen to sort of, sort of dig into, I guess, um, ultimately buying capacity, you know, uh, you said people have bought property 35 years. It's very easy to say that as a blanket statement because everyone's done well on property. <laughs> the reality is if you looked at the 10 million property owners in Australia, right. And all the people who have transacted in that, some have done really well. And they're probably just the people who bought a house on a good street in a, in a, in a capital city. You've seen people who've done really poorly in property. You know, you just have to look at core logic, pain and gain report to see and ask them a question. Should they bought property in the last 35 years? And they'd say no, because they've, <laughs> they bought an apartment that's gone backwards in prices or they've, et cetera. So the property journey is not equal. It's, it's, it's skewed to people who know how to use capacity and know how to buy quality assets. And it's easy to go back along in time and look at a graph and say, everyone should just buy property, but it's actually the property you buy and the time you buy it and how long you hold it. Um, uh, and when you sell it, um, is what determines the thing. I mean, the, the, the whole idea of rinse and repeat, when I started in broking back in 2013, 2014, you know, the whole system was different, right? Um, the APRA was letting the banks get away with anything. Really? There was <laughs> capacities across all the different banks were completely different. You went into NAV or Westpac, there was a big gap. You could borrow, if you knew how to work calculators, over 12 times income um, and more for investments than you could for homes. Homes are around six to eight times, investments maybe 12, 14 times. Like you could really work it. You could go to non-banks, you could do this. You could manufacture higher valuations. You could split your lending through different structures. Um, a lot of those things have been changed. I mean, APRA started coming, like Veronica mentioned, um, and capacity now is like down to five times. Um, it's, it's, and that, that's whether you're buying a home or investment, right? So it's, it's very hard to, in the current lending structure, unless you're super cashed up and you can buy through trusts and you put big deposits down and all the trusts self-service themselves, it's very hard to continue to rinse and repeat. So we've all got limited capacity. No one's not, not everyone's earning millions of dollars, right? 
Sure. Um, and we've also got to pay more for our homes now than we ever have because so our homes <laughs> are eating up more of our capacity. And so now everyone's got less capacity for investments. So the name of the game with property is using borrowing capacity wisely and rinse and repeat doesn't really work because once you've used it, unless you get significant increases in salary, you won't get significant increases in borrowing capacity. So the, the whole, uh, the, even if you get growth, you'll go back to a broker and they'll say, we can borrow an extra 200 grand. Um, and, and that, that's, that's if you got a 40 grand increase in salary, it should be a big jump. So what is those, like some case studies, I guess, around those properties, like what is it and what was the, the, the value add to, to outperform the market? Because that is the thing, you know, if you, if you're going to recommend this strategy, you've got to make sure that that property outperforms, not so they can buy another property, just so they've used that borrowing capacity wisely Mm -hmm. and they're getting a better market return. So I think, um, there's a, there's a lot to what you mentioned there, Chris. So, uh, if I miss any of it, by all means, prompt me, but the, um, I think the first step is no apartments, right? And, and, um, the reason it, it comes down, like I said before, step number one, understanding um, where you want to be. A lot of investors make a, a property investment decision based on the property they want to buy. The property yep. that, that you want to buy is nothing more than a vehicle or should not be any more than a vehicle to get compound growth. Yeah. That, that's it. If rubber bands gave me compound growth, I'd be an expert in rubber bands, but they don't. Okay. So l- l- land-based residential property assets do that. And I'd challenge you on the fact that that, that properties, you know, more expensive than, than what it's ever been. There are many areas in Australia, um, WA and Victoria right now, actually as, as case studies where they're more affordable as a percentage of income than back in 2013. Okay. But if you think about the population of the Australia and the majority of high income people, what cities do they live in? Sydney, Melbourne, Brisbane, and then also the sis, the sister cities to those cities. And so the majority of high incomes in the country. And the majority of people, uh, and, and people just generally are in those three cities. The price of properties in those three cities are way higher, uh, and use way more of their borrowing capacity than they did say 10 years ago. Yeah. Adelaide, Brisbane, Adelaide and Perth, you can use them as examples, but that's, that's not where the majority of incomes are. I just throw in something here because Adelaide and Perth is where a lot of investors are looking at the moment and rightly or wrongly. So I guess in a way that is that what you're talking about here, you're looking at that's one of the reasons why investors might be looking in markets like that because they're Absolutely. looking at that. That's one of the metrics that they're looking at the, the ratio of incomes to property values. Yeah, definitely. Like if we think about it, the reason I, I, I said Perth, because um, Perth actually has at last check, the second highest median income in Australia of the capital cities behind Sydney, yet their median house price is less than half of Sydney's. Yeah. Right. So but doesn't that um, deserve some interrogation? Because you're absolutely right. In fact, Perth at times has had the most expensive properties in Australia, but then it's also had some of the most diabolical property markets and, you know, a decade of, of stagnation or loss. So so the income is not it, it, if you're gonna use that as your only metric metric, that's obviously uncovering a weakness in that as a metric, right? Yeah, so I think this is yeah, the the point that I think we're all kind of getting to is is agreeing that a, a diversified portfolio across different locations in Australia is absolutely um, a great way to go. It's what I've got. It's what our clients have got. Because no, I didn't different- say that. I, uh, what I'm saying, <laughs> I didn't, it's, I'm not, I'm curious. It's just because you, you started talking about, um, you challenged Chris on his, um, and we like to be challenged. Yeah, don't yeah. get me wrong. I mean, yeah. we're we're up for uh, we're up for debate on this podcast. That's that's you know the elf in the room. We'll talk about these these lovely, big, challenging uh, topics. Um, yeah. And so you challenge him on that, but then but then I just want to draw a distinction to say: Does that mean that you were saying, ergo, those locations are good areas to invest in because of that, or is it purely because you're challenging Chris on that on that topic on that point? Oh, so, so I guess the point I'm making is that not all markets are the same at every point in time. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Except and in 2021, where everything was going up. <laughs> <laughs> right. Right. And, and I mean, we can, we can laugh about it, but you're exactly right. But that was the anomaly. Right. And so if that's the mindset that, that people are, are, yeah. are bringing to it, it's, it's not how markets typically work. Um, it's not how they've worked before prior to 
for that. We, we've never had interest rates at 0.1% either, right? Mm, as a cash true. rate. So, so typically in market cycles, you know, we see the, the larger capital cities start that trend, you know, so, um, Sydney, Sydney starts and then all of a sudden to your point, Chris, Sydney becomes unaffordable for a lot of people. And so what do people look to do? Well, if they want to be, if they want to buy their own, uh, their own home, then they either have to compromise on location and move further out mm-hmm. or they start to look to a more affordable capital city, you know, and, and that's why Melbourne typically follows Sydney being the next biggest business hub, um, Brisbane after Melbourne, Perth after that. And so there's, there's always these cycles and there's always opportunity just because the Sydney markets moved, for example, doesn't mean that an investor, wherever they live in Australia, can't buy in Brisbane or Perth or, or somewhere else. Yeah. So the major point here is encouraging the investors out there and, and the listeners to um, move beyond the suburb that you live in. Yeah. You know, there, there's, there's a lot of comfort that first time investors find by buying around the corner from where they live. Yeah. If we unpack, you know, back in the seventies and eighties, why that was the case, it's because, you know, everyone was just so concerned, rightly so concerned that if the rent didn't come in, then how are they going to cover the second mortgage? Yeah. So wanting to drive past their property is not necessarily because they love it. It's like, I really hope the lights are on so I can tell that the tenant's still there and I'm going to get my rent this Thursday. I yeah. think it's, it's called okay. home bias. We, we talk a lot about behavioral biases on this podcast. In fact, the, the foundation of this podcast is understanding human, human behavior and, and that's home bias. So that's, that's that thing that I know it. So therefore I understand it. And in, in a bigger con, uh, context, people are biased about their own attitudes and opinions around property because they live in one. You know, we all think we understand it. We think we should be able to do this on our own because we live in one, yep. right? So it's, it's sort of an extension of that in a way. And so it, it's comfort because let's face it, buying an investment property is a very challenging, you know, we go to system one thinking, system one thinking means, oh, you're around the corner. I know that it's safe. I can drive around. Yeah. I can see that it's there. That's fine. Um, and, and I agree with you. It's, it's certainly not a, a good basis to be making investment decisions, but, uh, but by the same token, it's not automatic that you should just be borderless and go anywhere, right? So, so there has to be, and you talk about analytics. I'm curious to know how far do those analytics go? Because I've tried to unpick uh, people's property portfolios, and I'm sure Chris has two. I know Chris has two actually, um, where they've gone with, say, a buyer's agent who says, "Yeah, I'll buy all over Australia. I'll pick markets and I'll go in and, and buy there." And then I hear anecdotally stories from local buyers agents and also local sales agents telling me laughing, well, the sales agents laugh, the other buyers agents don't laugh, um, telling these stories about the, the fly-in, fly-out buyers agents that don't know that local area and the sort of crap stock that they buy. And based on that pitch to their clients, you've got to be agnostic to the property. The property doesn't matter. It's just a vehicle, right? But the reality is there are better streets and there are better pockets. There are better types of properties. There are, there's a whole bunch of things um, that a local will understand. And yep. that's a risk for, for um, consumers when they're buying anywhere. I mean, I've seen all these young YouTubers now getting up, you know, saying you don't even need a buyer's agent here. You can buy in Perth. You don't even have to see the property, get a property manager inspect it. You know, and then they've got stories of instant equity uplift and all the lovely, oh, it makes me feel so good about my decision. There's just a lot of misinformation about this. So I'm really keen, and we will get to your metrics and how you measure your growth, by the way, because I'm really keen to understand that. But I'm really mm-hmm. keen to know, as a business that's been around nearly 20 years, what do you do to overcome that weakness of buying in any market? Yeah. So uh, you, you raised a really good point, Veronica, and, and it's about people being willing to do due diligence, right? Just because something sounds great or because, you know, Uncle Bob told me about the winner, at the you know, his mate bought in this place and it's it shot the lights out. Um, we, we're very quick. Uh, in Australia generally to want to see a return on investment by 10 o'clock tomorrow. Yeah. Right. And, and that is a recipe for failure, especially where property is concerned, because as you're saying, if you buy the right kind of property and you look at the fundamentals, basically focused around three key things, supply, demand, and affordability, then at, at a very high level, and we can, we can drill into it at a very high level, that's what our formula is about. You know, now, now we look at and get down to what are the percentage of owner occupiers in any particular area? You know, what's, what are the volume of transactions for, for owner occupiers and investors in any particular location? 
Yeah. Okay. Because quite often, and this is just based on doing thousands of appointments myself personally with with investors and potential investors over the years, is they're like, well, you know, I'd I'd rather invest in an area where there are a lot of renters because I know it's got rental appeal. And it's like, okay, so let's flip that on its head and say, if you're buying around in an area that's the majority um, owner occupied, yeah, are the majority of people in that area are going to hate the location? Is it going to not have appeal? I mean, they've chosen yeah. to live there, right? Um, but what we're doing is just creating a scenario where we've got very limited supply for rentals. Yeah. Now, supply and demand tells us that that will drive rental growth. So yeah. I'm happy to share a personal example here. Three of my properties um, in the last 12 months have seen rental growth of $95 a week, $85 a week, and $75 a week. No offense, but so is everybody. <laughs> Sorry. Right, right, <laughs> right. The rents right. are but, rising at ridiculous rates. But, yeah. but Chris, Chris, Chris said that everyone gets constrained and it's hard to borrow. Yeah. Right. Typical property management is put your rent up $10 a week because you want to keep the tenant. Yeah. Right. Because they don't want to have an uncomfortable co- conversation with the tenant. They forget they work for the landlord yeah. about putting the rent up. So you yeah. can't do that every year. I've had rents where the rent's barely moved, you know, but when... when when the market's in your favor, you've got to take advantage of it. And, and being able to drive rental growth is a great way to improve borrowing capacity but as well. That's well, do you know how much true. that increased your borrowing capacity though, Michael? So you said 85, was it 85, 75? And what was the last one? 95. 95. So 85 yep. and 75, that's 160 plus 95 is 255 a week, right? Mm-hmm. 255 a week times 52 weeks is $13,000, right? The yep. bank will haircut that by nine to 90%. It was 80%. So now that's a twelve thousand increase to your annual salary. You times that by five, you've got sixty grand extra borrowing capacity. Mm-hmm. So you've got a major increase in rents that probably catch up for years that you couldn't increase rents. But all you got was a sixty grand increase in your borrowing capacity. It's very just because of how tight multiples are. If multiples were twelve times, mm. you'd get a hundred and fifty grand increase to your borrowing capacity. That's the difficulty, right? And and what as a percentage, how much were those rental increases? Like, were they twenty percent increases? You know, to the like, was it a fifteen to twenty percent? We've yeah, had some so, clients that have had as much as twenty eight percent. But yeah. I think the the point that you're getting to, Chris, is a really good one, and it, and it talks to how people can duplicate and how they pick property, right? Um, because when we're looking at servicing, there are three sources of income that you've got to be able to hold an investment property. There's the rent, obviously. So a strong rental yield is key, and driving rents up is really really important. Yeah. The big one that most people forget about it and are not aware of are the tax benefits. Okay. And um, especially with interest rate rises, the best way to protect against that is if you've got tax deductible interest and you're able to increase the amount of tax benefit in an environment where the interest rates are going up, then that's putting thousands of dollars back in your pocket. So you absolutely need to find that balance, right? But as I said before, um, a lot of people have invested in apartments because the tax benefits via the depreciation are massive. So they've done really well from a cash flow perspective, but the growth hasn't been there. Okay. So you need to factor in all of the income and be smart about how you can maximize all of that income to allow you to be able to um, add to the portfolio over time as well. And I think your owner occupy rates is amazing. Well, that's what we would, would encourage. You know, you, you buy in areas people want to live and, and, and raise families in and people want to upgrade within and they love this. The, and people don't sell out of those areas. So listings stay really low. Um, and you always get an undersupply ultimately. You don't yep. buy apartments. So if you so what are you buying? Is it is it mainly townhouses and houses or like what what are the what's what's the properties? Yeah, exactly right. Land based investments are, are the open court model. Yeah. Yep. So and, and are these generally new or older properties? Generally new. Uh, we do do established if it's if it's the best thing to, to suit a client's portfolio, but but generally new. Um, we realise that building new is not uh, not risk free, but we provide as part of our service. Uh, we're we're effectively backing our expertise and our experience, so we provide risk protections and mitigations against the things that can go wrong. So, um, what can yeah, go it's wrong? been uh, yeah. So the the first one is the builder can go bust. That's the worst. Uh, the one that's in the media a lot lately is uh, aside from builders going bust is that um, you know people that are under contract with a builder can have cost increases. Um, there are fixed price contracts and then there are fixed price contracts. Yeah. Um, we <laughs> offer the latter that are, that are, you know, no holes fully fixed. Um, and if there are overruns, then yeah, as a company, we, we cover them. So yeah. um, it's about us being able to see the market, anticipate the market, 
we could tell that the uh, the labour shortages and the supply shortages were going to cause concern. So yeah, our, our question, uh, our clients' early days had questions around, oh, I can find this bill cheaper online, and we're like, yep, took them through the education as to why and what it was. Um, they got their house bill problem free with a tenant getting a lot, bringing in a lot more rent than what they budgeted on because we always do the numbers conservatively, as opposed to being someone you know that's caught short has to get more finance for a build increase, potentially can't, and, and a whole world of hurt that comes with that. So, um, yeah, it's, it's look, it's a, it's a challenging um, environment to be building by yourself, but that's part of the support that, that we provide around that um, so that our clients can get the benefits of, um, uh, of building new. To be honest, I didn't actually realise that's what you guys did. And I, I poured all over your website uh, before interviewing you today and your PR company had, you know, obviously uh, reached out to us and, and, you know, I want to get back to the, how you calculate growth because this sort of actually makes it even more interesting. Um, so I didn't know that we're, we're, and I know you haven't listened to any of our episodes and you would not know therefore that we're not a fan of buying brand new. And one of the reasons we're not a fan about buying brand new is that there are, well, there, I guess two main things. One is risk. Uh-huh. Uh, you just talked about a couple of them. Um, but that's that's a couple of the risks in the build itself. But the one of the huge risks with buying brand new is that you're often buying in a subdivision that is on the outskirts of a city where scarcity is the issue and there's ongoing supply. So I guess um, you talked about mitigating, like, you know, offsetting, I guess, the risk of the build. And you're talking about land as being the important component here in terms of the value. So... What do you do to mitigate that risk of reproducibility of land? Yeah, we don't go to the, the, to the very outskirts. So it's one of those, um, quite rightly, I guess one of the obvious um, conclusions people arrive at is if you're building, you, you need to be on the outskirts. Um, I guess the benefit of, uh, of what we've done and what's underpinned the results is that you know, we don't want to be one of these companies you know, that are doing a thousand, thousands and thousands of properties a year, because you have at some point for quantity, you have to sacrifice on quality. But are you building, are you the builder? Are you the developer? No, no, we're not the builder, nor the, nor the, nor the builder. Um, our, our point of difference is the, uh, the research and analytics team that we've got in-house, okay, that are picking the eyes out of where are all these suburbs that meet all the criteria. Yeah. Um, look, every single one, you know, hasn't, uh, hasn't completely aced it, but 78% of the suburbs that we've invested in since we started have beaten the market. Um, hence I talked about diversification and so on. So we're looking at, at what we call infill areas, Veronica. So existing suburbs, uh-huh. uh, with small boutique land subdivisions, you know, where we can, um, uh, cost effectively put an effective, you know, family based family focused property, um, together. At a uh, at an attractive price, comparable to the um, the comparable sales that are happening, which are, are typically those established houses. Does the bill does the developer pay you, or does the client pay you? No, our clients pay us. Yep. Um, the the builders pay us a referral fee because they're effectively saving on advertising headcount. They're not manning a a, a sales office. Um, you know, all the overheads that that come with a, a standard retail price on the build. Um, we don't take anything from the developer, we charge a fee for service. So it's all transparent and, you know, we're super proud of the fact that since we started every year, um, at least 50% of our business has been repeat and referral. So we'd like to think the proof's in the pudding. If the service is good and our clients are making money, uh, they're coming back and they're telling people about who we are and, and what we do. They, they wouldn't be able to repeat if there were, um, you know, like a lot of companies have done in the past, take massive kickbacks. So. We don't need to take anything from the developer. It, it actually works the other way. A lot of the time we're beating the door down to try to get into the right areas and using every bit of leverage and buying power that we have given our 20 years experience in the, um, in the market to get access to these areas. Um, you know, if we were a new company that didn't have those relationships, it'd be near impossible in a high demand market to get into those locations. So yeah, we, uh, we've got a bit of a different model than, um, you know, trying to drive a massive volume and yeah. Um, uh, and, and have it around those motivated people that want to build a portfolio. So, so the person that's saying your fee, fee for service, let's say your fee is 20 grand, are they then getting the refund from the developer or the developer's not really giving you much refunds because they've got great stock that they could sell anyway? Like, yeah, the latter. There's, there's no, there's no, there aren't kickbacks from developers. Yeah. Yeah. So there's, and, and, it, and it's, 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 it's a, it's a lot less than, uh, than 20 K Chris's. Okay. Um, your fee. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, so just like, so land infields aren't, 
you know, they're, they're hard to find, right? They're hard to find them, right? So when you're, com um, and ultimately the developer's still there to make a profit, right? So they're cutting up land and they're cutting up land um, into blocks as small as they can sell them. The developers there to make profit. It's a return on equity play, right? It's not here. So it's not a, con uh, a charitable business, right? <laughs> and so the developer on the infield site is, is trying to sell blocks, usually at a much smaller land size than existing blocks in the suburb in infield. So you're usually buying 300 or 400 squares and they're usually playing for the affordability play. Their target market in infill sites is the people who can't afford houses. Um, and and so generally speaking, the price of those properties, so the quality of the, the build and the, the, the land size has to be smaller. And you're not going to, ultimately, the people with money in that suburb would go to the house and the people who haven't got the income there, they would go and buy in these infilled areas, right? Is that sort of the demand generally? Yeah, so um, you're right. Land sizes are definitely getting smaller. Right. There, there's absolutely nothing wrong with a 400 square meter block and a four bed, two bath, double lock up garage house because tenants don't want maintenance. No, right? but from a growth um, point of view, from an equity uh, point of view, so we're not worried about... Is, yeah. I have to yeah. laugh here. This is all relative. You know, here I am sitting on my four bedroom, two bathroom <laughs> house in Newtown on 255 square meters. I moved from a house in Balmain, which is on 455. It's absolutely palatial. Um, and you guys are going, oh, 400, that's not too small. Uh, it is all relative and in different, uh, different cities. Um, and it all comes down to land value in a, a city such as Sydney, where land is more expensive than any other city, a 255 square meter block in, a, in an inner city suburb is, is extraordinarily large and expensive, right? Uh, but if you go into somewhere where the, the average land size is 900 square meters, 400 is tiny. Uh, in Sydney, in a lot, a lot of these new subdivisions, uh, even some of these infill sites where you're getting freestanding houses, and they might be doing it on 220 square meters, but they're in the the sort of middle to outer ring. It's small comparative to what is surrounding it in yeah. terms of the established areas. So I guess let's not get hung up on the actual land size here. Let's talk about more uh -huh. the relativity of the new block size versus what's what's seen as valuable, I guess, in those areas or, or desirable, not so much valuable. So maybe I'm paraphrasing you here, Chris, is the, is the question that these infill sites in some of these cities, they're targeting specifically that affordability um, or the, the affordability buyer who can't afford the, whatever, the bigger blocks, the, the freestanding, the established houses in those areas. And so this is a sort of a, a smaller, it might still be four bedroom, two bathroom, but it's a more compact model with less outdoor space um, for that new market. Is that, but then typically too, the, these newer stuff is sold at a premium anyway, isn't it? Like, you know, when you look at. It, it is, it, it is if, if you're buying a brand new completed house. Right, yeah, right, because because the builder in that case, if you're buying, and this is kind of gets to the point I was talking about before around people not wanting to build, so they go right. Well, it's easier if I buy something complete. They're paying stamp duty on the on the entire purchase price, right? Um, the builders had to pay stamp duty on the land before they can build it, so that'll be built into the price, and then they're covering the interest in most cases, or they've taken the money out of another part of the business, so they're not getting a financial return on that interest that's payable while they're building the house. So that's built into the, the, the end price as well. But if you, if you're getting a land price, uh, and then you're working with a builder and you're only paying stamp duty on the land and as the buyer, you're covering the interest during construction, yeah. right. Then it's much more cost effective. Yes. You have to wait, you know, the build period until you've got the rent coming in. Yeah. But when you look at the total cost to acquire. And you look at the rental yield and the cash for the holding costs upon completion, it's a far more attractive proposition. So yeah, look, building is definitely not the easiest or the, uh, or the best way to go. It's not without its hurdles. Um, but that's why we do it most of the time because it's, yeah. uh, it's just the most effective to be able to, um, uh, yeah, get that low, low holding cost result. It's, it's... And also what it allows us to do, I mentioned buying power before, um, when you've got the kind of relationships that we've got over a long period of time. The builders will actually work with us, you know, to custom design um, certain um, floor plans to fit certain dimension blocks. Okay, so they all look different. They have different facades and, and different colors and all that kind of thing. Um, but what we're able to put together is what we call optimum size and quality. Because if you think about a builder's motivation, it's profit. How do they maximize well, everybody's their Everybody's motivation really is profit, isn't it? In right. business. 
Yeah. Like fundamentally. Yeah. And, and that's why we talk about the repeat and referral and cause that, that's, that's how we generate the profit is through that repeat and referral outcome. So we like to think it's win-win, but if you think about a builder's profit, uh, builder's motivation being profit, um, then the number one way that they do it is they say, right, you pick from, you know, set number of floor plans and all of those floor plans have additional square meterage that costs extra, but doesn't actually contribute to driving the rent up in any way. Yeah. Okay. So when I'm talking about optimum size and quality, please don't think I'm talking about small and boxy or cheap and nasty, far from it, but fit for purpose and efficient, right, is where we can add extra value because if we can shave you know, 20, 30, 40, 50,000 off a bill price through buying power and through this customization process. But the rent is exactly the same as someone that's built something through a builder off the shelf. Then, yeah, that's a far better outcome and it allows our clients to be able to duplicate as well. I'm on a personal mission to help more people make better property decisions. And you can find out all about what I'm working on at veronicamorgan.com.au. And there you'll find resources for first home buyers, details about my buyer's agent mentoring program, access to suburb help for investors, or if you're looking to buy your dream home or an investment property in Sydney's inner west, eastern suburbs or lower North Shore, you can connect with my team at Good Deeds Property Buyers. If you're thinking about buying your first home, upgrading to a new one or purchasing an investment property anywhere in Australia, we would love to carefully guide you through this journey and importantly, get the finance right. Please reach out via our website, wealthful.com.au. Don't forget that you can download our free full or forecaster report. Which experts can you trust to get it right? The elephant in the room dot com dot au. So what sort of things are you customizing? Because I know that the minute you start customizing that it actually increases the cost. I mean, you buy off the rack because there's efficiencies in that. I do know looking at house and land packages that you've got a, you've got a whole subdivision, you've got all these different blocks of land, all different aspects, and people just go and buy, oh, I like that house, and they plonk it on the block without any real thought to aspect and all the rest of it. Are you saying then that there's a smaller version of these houses that you're buying, which is cheaper to build because there's less square meterage in it, but it's it's basically taking out the fat, you know, there's no, it's unnecessary, in which case... I'll, I'll give an example, Veronica. So a, a mate of mine's a builder. Uh, he, his, his standard investment floor plan is a three bedroom home that's 240 square meters. All right. Okay. So bedrooms determine rent. So rent would be you know, whatever it is in a particular suburb for three bedrooms. Okay. Um, if we are able to eliminate wasted space, not the essential space, but, but you know, wasted space, um, then we're able to get something at say 210 square meters, give or take as a floor plan. That's four bedrooms. Then we've saved the build costs on the extra 30 square meters. And we've brought in the extra rent for for four bedrooms versus three bedrooms. Yeah, that that's the kind of example I'm I'm, I'm talking about. Okay, I definitely think there's some arbitrage benefits in buy power, but it's also a bit counterintuitive, right? So, for example, you could make someone buy the land, and you could make some money through the build, you know, through your buying power. Ultimately, we're saying we want to buy in areas that are driven by home buyers, not own um, investors. So, if you're if you end up buying lots of that stock, you're just going <laughs> to create a glut of investors and. We know that renters don't treat the suburb and the houses generally the same as people who own or occupy, right? And you get turnover mm-hmm. of people and the community benefits aren't there uh, and people are more likely to leave. And that will ultimately lead to more supply and listings. Um, and it ends up being a pocket within a suburb that people don't really want to live, you know, because they know that's investors. And so it's got to be, yeah, we can buy some of the stock, but you can't be buying 40, 50% of it because you'll be basically flipping the market. The, the, the money making money on the build, it's a sh- you can potentially do it versus the person who buys the finished product. You're making money because you're defunding the build. So there might be a short-term arbitrage you can make, but short-term arbitrage doesn't get you long-term growth. Long-term growth will be driven by scarcity of land and ultimately the demand that wants that land. Also the type of property. And the, you got to have a scarce property. type of property. I mean, you can't have all same, same, same because... Um, That's why you're looking at the boutique developments. Like, remember, we're not talking about large master plan communities out on the outskirts that are thousands of blocks. Uh, we're, we're talking about these existing suburbs, you know, within existing areas. It, that, like that, 50, that, 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 40, is, 100, like... Yeah, oh, anywhere from 19 to 200, typically. Right. Yeah. yeah. And um, t- are you comparing them against existing stock within that suburb 
Do you think that these new builds in this new community outperform the better streets and the more established parts of that suburb that are bigger blocks that ultimately people are less likely to sell and more likely wanting to be in those streets because of land, because of the community, um, et cetera. Are you comparing apples and apples? So this new development infill site, the growth on that as a percentage to the existing houses on the better streets, not the busy roads, not the dark places. Mm -hmm. um, uh, <laughs> we, not we're, not, we're not there either because we're guaranteeing the, the rental demand for our clients as well. So we, we won't have, you know, battle axe blocks and we won't be on busy roads and it won't be the, the last available block in an area because yeah. all of those things would impact rental demand uh, for sure. But, but in, in terms of, of an area, right, what, what we're wanting to do, remember, we're not making investing about the property. Right, we use a selection process of elimination where we're looking, we call it the map process. So which capital city market or markets make sense at any point in time? We, we talked about how they cycle. Within those capital city markets, which are the areas, locations, pockets, growth corridors, yeah, in proximity to principal activity centers and all of those things that, that you mentioned, um, you know, with high percentages of owner occupiers. And by the way, all of the developers, because it's a really key point, all of the developers that we work with know our criteria. So we don't work with developers that will saturate an area with, you know, all of their blocks for investment. They know what our, our metrics are. And if they want the ongoing quality business with us, then, then they adhere to those. Okay. That's how we, we mitigate against large volumes of rental supply coming on at any, any particular point in time. And that's why we guarantee the rent, because if that wasn't happening, and 40 rentals all came onto the market at a point in time, then we'd be paying money to our, to our clients because that they'd need that. They wouldn't have a, you know, they wouldn't have a signed lease within so a month. Are, are you so, able to quarantine then some of the stock so that the developer then has to sell the rest to owner occupiers? Is that what you say? No, we work with developers that share the same strategy as us. So there are some developers that come in and are, are happy to sell whatever to the market. As long as they sell their stuff, then no problem. There are quality developers out there that, care about reputation and care about feel and care about the estates that they build and the communities that they build, they're the ones that we want to work with because we know, like we've had exam examples in the past where, you know, if we got access to another 20 blocks, we could sell them in a week, but the developers won't give them to us and we don't compromise our criteria because that's the most important thing is making sure that we keep that balance and all that amenities appealing. Because again, you want a, a family tenant to, to come into a brand new home, to like it, it's well finished, it's good quality, it's in close proximity to all the amenity. That means that our clients get the consistency of rental income long term. Yeah. Right. And gives them the confidence to be able to get the next one and the next one. So we're not trying to pick the absolute perfect property in any particular suburb. What we're talking about is, right, where have we got more expensive comparable sales to where we can buy for value? Um, it's not about an instant equity uplift. It's more around where can we buy for value? Yeah. The uplift is nice, but it's more around the long-term growth potential. And as comparable sales sell for more and more, that's what creates the equity that allows our clients to get the next one and the next one. Yeah. So fundamentally, a portfolio of, of three or four you know, above average properties is going to beat one amazing star performing property every day of the week from a portfolio point of view. Um, and no one's got the crystal ball to know what the perfect one yeah. is anyway. So that's that's the, the the formula that we follow. So we're comparing, if we're comparing exactly the same market exposure, not the number of properties, because, you know, you could always say three properties are going to outperform one. Well, well not always. Like three properties at 300,000 aren't going to outperform a property that's growing at 1.5 million. So it's market exposure. It's not the number of properties. The uh -huh. second thing is good properties don't ever have a problem getting a tenant. The reality is great properties are scarce to rent or they're scarce to buy. You go to any, you know, look at vacancy rates around the country. So especially you at should, the moment, <laughs> you should never, if you're an investor and you're worried about rent, you're probably buying the wrong property. The reality is you don't need rental guarantees. You don't need, um, even worried about your renters not paying your rent. If you're worried about your renters not paying rent. That's why we offer it, Chris. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Because we've, we've got the fundamental belief yeah. if if the criteria are correct, we don't need to pay it. Exactly. So so, yeah. so, so rental but rental growth is driven. <laughs> um, sorry, sorry. I Just let me check on that. You offer it because you don't need to give it. it so it well, sounds it, 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 good. <laughs> Is it, sorry, I'm, I'm being cynical here. <laughs> okay. So, so if we are guaranteeing 
that our, that our clients will have a signed lease in place within a month of the house being finished, right? And, and, and we guarantee the rental income that they, that they receive, then that's a massive exposure to us mm. if we're in the wrong areas or the wrong kind of properties or the properties are not well chosen. Now, 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 we provide that, and we've provided it from day one. What I'm saying, Veronica, is our, our risk and exposure on that is low because that's a way that we put our money where our mouth is, right, to be able to demonstrate to a, if there's a nervous first-time investor that's stepping in and they're worried about not having rental income, then I completely agree with you guys. You know, in, in a rental market like this especially, a quality property won't have a, pro won't have a problem getting a tenant, but Actually, if that provides everything. peace of mind to help people get in and then they see some growth and they realize, well, yeah, maybe I can do this investment thing and I'm more comfortable with it. Mm, Just like sure. people are the second, third time they've ridden a bike. That, that's what I'm getting at is it's, it's designed to give them comfort and peace of mind with us knowing that our selection criteria results in, you know, next to no vacancy at worst and long-term tenants at best. I think that the, the best way to compare though is, is to say, not rental in growth, like rental um, growth, right? That is is market forces, there's supply, there's income restrictions on that, especially in the markets you're targeting. Is, it's even, you know, that 20% increase in rents, that was a one-off. You've been able to increase your rents 20% probably, um, you know, every three years, et cetera, you know? Like it, rental growth is restricted by the people who are renting, right? Um, and a lot of rental growth doesn't go up. You know, there's times when, you know, there's a, you can't lift rents even though wages are going up. So you got to be careful with rental growth. The thing that drives rental growth the most is capital growth, right? The more people who can't afford to buy in those areas, the more people are forced to rent, and the more people pay for rent because they can't afford to buy. Um, and, you know, a house would have higher rental growth than a new apartment or a townhouse because ultimately people really want to own the house. That's why it's more expensive. When you're looking at growth, yes, their value compared to current properties within the market, but ultimately when you come back in 10 years' time, have you then gone and measured that the growth on your property versus the growth of what you could have bought a house in that same suburb 10 years later and seen the difference in growth? Because you can't get a cheaper property that's targeted at the affordability segment mm -hmm. to outperform a property that's targeted at the aspirational segment. This is the one for one, one for one, right? You might, you might not be one for one. You might be down ever so slightly. But if I've been able to get three or four cumulatively over that time, then the compound growth of that far exceeds, right? It's not, it's not about trying to buy the perfect property. It's about the, vo the, the, the same market exposure. So instead of buying three cheaper, that's, that's the point. On, that's on, the on, point. Can we, can, is, can, is before, you, you, can we just, before we go down this path, what's your metric? How have you measured that your average, uh, your client on average has delivered what? Two twenty five 25.8%, I think you said. Higher growth eight, rates yep. of house prices compared with average market uh, returns. What, so it's, it's what is twenty five point eight percent total return? And the way that we've done that is we look at the actual because we've got a property management team. We look at the actual rents that we're achieving from when the properties first came online to what they are now. But hang on, no, 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 you're saying growth rates of house prices, not rents. What, no, to what? total return is what we've beaten the market by. So we've outperformed the market by 25.8%. And, that, and that's a combination of capital growth outperformance and rental growth outperformance. Ah, see, what was okay. written to and, us, just so you know, because I copied this, right? is growth rates of house prices. So what you're saying is that it's not actually growth rates of house prices. You're saying it's a return on investment calculation. The total return has beaten the market by 25.8%. Right. And now, how, comparing that to like the Melbourne market. So like yeah, this yeah, yeah. townhouse in um, so-and-so suburb has outperformed the Melbourne market, includes apartments or Melbourne housing market. No, yeah, good, 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 good question. So what it is, is we look at the actual um, growth, rental and capital growth that we've seen, and we compare that to the median um, house growth and the median rental growth in all of those suburbs. Okay, and so then... every single suburb that we're in, we look at what the, the median price was here and here and the median rent here and here in whatever year against, you know, what we came in at and what the current values are at. And how have you determined current values? How, how do they get? Um... So based on revaluations. So we, we, get, we get properties revalued um, and that, that's how we assess it. So, so, so let's just say as an example, so you've got a house selling for a million dollars, you buy a new 
townhouse or a new house at 800000 because it's value within the suburb. But the rental yield is slightly higher because it's a new property versus an older house. So the rent might be exactly the same, right? So, But the yield's higher because it's a new property and it's a lower purchase price. Mm-hmm. Um, 10 years later, the house um, growth and the growth in the rental return is substantially less than the growth by 25% than the growth in your property and your rental return. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, the, 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 the combined value of the rental growth and the capital growth in the areas where we've been has outperformed the median performance in those suburbs by that amount. Yeah. So you're saying that you can make more money on a new... And that's since 2010. So that, that's the time frame we're talking about. Um, have, you, have you got like an, a pro, like an example of a property that we could just sort of roll this through? Any property. You could pick any property you've done over the last 20 years. Mm-hmm. Um, and... I'll just quickly do some stuff on Google and I'll compare that to a house. <laughs> okay. So um, in a Live Brisbane action. suburb in a in, in a Brisbane suburb called Polara, um, our clients were paying five sixty five to five seventy um, in twenty eighteen. And we're getting valuations today depending on land size, um, eight twenty to eight thirty give or take. So they, they bought it for what, five fifty did you say? So say five sixty five. And now it's worth eight fifty. Eight thirty. Yeah. Okay. And then how how long ago did they buy it? Twenty eighteen. So that that that's when they settled on the land. And then we, we constructed in, in Polara after that. So it would have been leased in twenty nineteen. And so Polara is is, you know, if we're looking at it from a suburb, um, in that marketplace you've had um that's that's a, that's a new sort of subdivision on the outskirts, right? Like in New York, Polara's only eighteen k's from from the Brisbane CBD, so uh, no, not... definitely not outskirts, but definitely infill. Yeah, so <laughs> they've um they had they had yeah you know, like kind of semi acreage properties uh, around there, uh, or the suburbs surrounding it are either green wedge or existing uh, medium density residential, um, a bit of high density residential scattered throughout. To the north of Polara now, you can see that they're starting to cut up those acreages into new house. And land Are you houses. looking at Google Maps or near maps? Yeah, or? yeah. Google Google Maps is about five years old. So w- what it looks like is being cut up is all well and truly finished by now. But yeah, they're, they're yeah. Um, I imagine those semi acreage landholders have have got together and and sold sold to do a, to a developer, and they've they've been turned into boutique land land subdivisions. So those people in Polara, just isn't it, just talking through a case study. So those people in Polara, they bought five years ago. They've they've made some short term growth mainly off a of drop in interest rates plus build costs go up. Um, yeah, they've been able to rent, but if ultimately the affordability market out there, like it's a choice to rent anywhere in Brisbane, it's quite far from the city. It's not two k's, it's eighteen k's. When you look to the north, you've got um, lots of acreages that are now turning into more supply, which is actually getting built over the last five years. So as a new home buyer. You've got a choice. You buy a brand new house and land package, which ultimately people like cars. They want new, not old. Or you can buy a four-year-old house. The oven's four years old. The roof's four years old. Everything's four years old. Or I can buy something new. So ultimately the growth, yeah, it's gone up, but your buyers are now buying the new stuff rather than the old stuff, unless it's cheaper. We're, 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 not, we're not buying in there now. We bought in there before before it happened. Yeah, but the people who still yeah. your clients are still owning properties in there, right? So future growth yeah. matters, not just initial growth. Future growth. So future growth in here is going to be restrained because new properties are going to come on that are ultimately competition for this. And then if new townhouses come on two kilometers down the road, which you start to look on the map, just south of Polara in Forestdale, um, another big land holding rural, they could easily cut that up into. House and land packages. So you notice it. that in in forest, that's all low density. But we won't get into one suburb versus versus another. But no, the, I'm the just point, saying that this. The point this is, away. You can that there, there, there's away. land constraint in there, right? And so the the um, as that land constraint gets fully full, that constrained land gets fully built out, right? The the areas where at a really affordable price point in Brisbane are out past you know Springfield Central and beyond. So if you think about the way that Australians move house, you know, they move house on average between every eight and nine years and they move within seven Ks generally towards the city. So over time, the demand of people wanting to move closer is what continues to drive that up. 
Um, and when you've got when you've constrained the supply, which you can do in in locations with small infill developments, as opposed to you know the the large three and a half thousand lot um, master plans, they take a lot longer, obviously, to um, to be built out. That's why we look at these small boutique developments within the existing suburbs because that additional new land supply is con- um, is constrained day one. We see uplift as people want to come in right before it's finished. Um, then it is finished, and we get the the competition for the existing housing. So, not that our clients are looking to sell in a four or five year period, but as they as the competition for the established houses comes up, that continues to drive the benchmark up, which improves the comparable sales, and allows yeah our clients to be able to unlock the equity to to repeat. So, uh, and sorry, just going back to. Say in the Polara example, when you're talking about, when you're looking at the return on investment and comparing that to um, the rest of the market, what is the rest of the market there? Is it all of Brisbane? Is it the surrounding suburbs? Is it 5K radius? Is it the same suburb? Like what, what is used as the benchmark? Say in that so example, I mean, as, mm-hmm. as your, as your. Um, so the, the, me- the median house price growth over the same time. In that suburb? In, in, in Polara, yeah. Right. So it's, it's, it's suburb by suburb analytics and comparisons. Yep. Yep. I think, I think one of the challenges when you start getting 18 case in the city, in a place like Brisbane, all right, um, is there's lots of bigger blocks, um, and you can change an 800 to a 400, right? Um, and the, the ultimately as Brisbane's growth goes through a next phase of growth, where people get forced out of houses. At the moment, people have been able to buy houses in Brisbane. Ultimately, if you look at the biggest growth in Brisbane, if you told me spending six hundred grand in Brisbane four years ago, I would have bought a house in Barden. That house <laughs> would be worth one point one million. I would have bought a house in Woolloongabba. In um, um you know, uh, uh, there's lots of places: Balmoral, Graceville, to the north, places like Stafford Heights. You could have bought houses in these areas for six hundred grand when you bought this, and they would have got way more growth than two hundred grand. Um. Yes, yeah, you may. And, and I would argue that the rental growth would have been just as strong. Plus, ultimately, you probably add value to these properties and renovate them and turn them into, um, you know, dream family homes for people. These are, these are suburbs where people in Sydney and Melbourne would move to and leave their family and friends. They're aspirational places. And so if you really wanted to compare the growth of Polara, it wouldn't be comparing it to Polara. It'd be comparing to what else could I have done for $600,000 or whatever it was mm. in the Brisbane market back in 2018. And I think you'll be surprised that the growth on that has been nowhere near that. Um, and ultimately, that's that's the key thing. Your, your investors four years ago made a decision to invest $600,000 in Brisbane. I would argue they would have made more money on an old Queenslander around the cap, around the centre than they would what have. Would it cost, what, what would it have cost them to hold that, Chris? And what's the risk? Uh, to be honest, yields in Brisbane are very strong. You would have bought that with almost 5% yield. Right. Maintenance? Stamp duty on the whole lot. Like they, 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 this is, this is, you, you keep coming back to this one for one comparison, right? Stamp duty on the whole lot. Absolutely. Maintenance. Yeah. To be honest, when you do, you do a b- good building and pest. Maintenance isn't as much. That's, that's a belief that, you know, maintenance. On an old, on an old Queenslander, you, you, you'd be completely comfortable with the, with the, if you're starting out, you'd be completely comfortable. Most of your money goes into the land firstly. So if you're 600, you're, you're buying yep. something and then you do a great building and pest on it. You make sure it's structurally sound. You make sure it's not in a flood zone. You make sure it's on a good street and you make sure it's been recently renovated in the last 15 years. Ultimately, yeah, I mean, I mean, maintenance think... is, I've got properties, clients yeah. with those properties that have spent not spent dollar on them and uh, would have, their properties have pretty much doubled in that time frame. Okay. And, and when you go through a period like we've had with nine consecutive interest rate rises, if, if, you, if you, your holding costs might have been low four years ago when the interest rates were really low, but if you're just relying on rental yield and there's not a lot of ta- tax benefits contributing and offsetting that because you can't claim depreciation on the fixtures and fittings being established, maybe the, maybe the structure depending on age, right? Then, then, I, I then you've got a, you've got a much we... greater exposure when, when interest rates go up. No, because debt's based on purchase price. So debt was per, debt's based on six, yeah, 600,000. Yeah. So, and the yields were 5% at that point. Yields have gone up. Rent, rent growth in the last four years, these things right. are still positively geared. Also, have got to remember, negative gearing, you've got to pay, pay a dollar to get back, on average, 35 cents. So, yes, it can help your cash flow and it takes the mm-hmm. edge off, but you're still losing 65 cents So for every dollar. So, you know what I mean? Like negative yep. gearing, yeah, it, sure, it, it makes it less painful in your hip pocket as you own that property, 
But if if you've made two hundred thousand on a property versus another property with a few extra costs where you might have made six hundred thousand, then I would argue that 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 cash flow uh, incentive and maybe saving a couple of percent on the purchase price and stamp duty and maybe having to spend a little bit more on maintenance, I guess that pales in into insignificance if you look at comparing um, a capital growth differential of four hundred thousand. I'll throw a scenario back at you guys. What if you were able to hold three properties for the same cash flow? And they and they all did two hundred thousand. You've made the same amount, but long term you've got exposure to three. No, no, no. Hang on, but you still spent six hundred thousand on each of them, right? So yeah, so you still buy three of them. You need one point eight market exposure, so you need to borrow eight one point eight million, right? Yep. Why don't you just buy two? You could buy three three old properties. You would have just because old properties cost too much out of your pocket, and there's a lot of risk to hold them, especially with maintenance. No, so you can minimize maintenance and risk. The four hundred thousand differential is the risk, it isn't it? Maintenance costs, costs, it's the risk. Maintenance, that's a, it's the relief. To say <laughs> that's that a that's a drop in the bucket. <laughs> maintenance costs you can definitely avoid through not buying a place that's going to fall down. Property's been there for 40, mm-hmm. 50, 60 years. Um, that is, is structurally sound, right? The maintenance cost, and it's tax deductible if there is any maintenance anyway. So I would say that you can't you can't compare the multiple of properties. So, so would you say your maintenance risk is is the same with new versus established? I'd actually say it's even higher with new. If you talk about people with um, off the plan sector and who have got apartments yep. um, with no building warranty, I would argue that that's potentially a big Absolutely risk. Absolutely agree where apartments are concerned, but but we're not doing apartments. So, yeah, but if, if, issues. if you get into TikTok, have a look at Site Inspector because he does his amazing pre settlement inspections of brand new properties. He's based in Melbourne. We've interviewed him on your first home buyer guide. He, he in fact, listen to that yeah. interview if anyone's interested in that. So, the risk of um, problems with brand new properties, even with a warranty, the nightmare of trying to get these things fixed. Is, mm-hmm. And it's great that you guys um, are very proactive with that, with your. But as a concept, new versus um, established, and the belief that new doesn't require maintenance. You know, you guys might be mitigating that, but but as a whole, uh, that is a misconception because new can. I didn't say that in, didn't require maintenance. I said there's a lot less maintenance on new than there. When when you go in eyes wide open at the start. There's a lot less maintenance on you than what there is on established, or at least the potential to be. And the the the, the potential maintenance on established can be dramatic. I think too right? that a lot of people make that assumption with you, and so they don't actually maintain it, and then and then things yeah. actually um, accumulate. But uh, so that's the, sort the, of... the analogy I use is like just because you just because you buy a new car doesn't mean that you neglect to get it serviced. You, you've still got to spend yeah. a bit of money on it to, to, to maintain it. We, we, we're definitely not saying there's no maintenance with, with brand new. Spend a little bit on a, on a frequent basis and you get a much better result long term. Absolutely. I, I think also, I think, but you use the, the, you said that the maintenance is a risk and yes, it is a risk, but it's a much smaller risk than the, the um, potential for lost or missed opportunity um, in terms of capital growth because of the location and the, the choice of property. Um, a lot of maintenance and- actually is value add. So let's say you, you buy a property, mm. right? And the reason you bought that property at a million dollars, not 1.1 million is because it needed a new roof because it wasn't painted because it, you know, did need things sort of changed to it, right? When you make those changes, you add the value back, um, especially under building costs is going up. So if, mm-hmm. if you, if you go into eyes wide open, Yes, some maintenance is sunk cost, right? If it's things that may be fixing the footings on the property, right? But you get that check. So ultimately, a lot of maintenance on investment properties that are established property are value-add opportunities. Um, and you can factor that in when you go in. Um, and so you, you turn a negative into a positive. You turn that into growth. Um, and ultimately, a finished, established, renovated property will get a premium in the market. So if you have got a property that has got some, ultimately, things need to be spent money on it, if you can afford to spend those things, that money then you're going to add value to the properties. So I think that's an if, if you can, but just at the start of the uh, of the chat, Chris, remember you were talking about how borrowing capacity can be constrained. And, you know, we were talking about the fact that one property is not going to get, get you where you want to go. So yeah, you might get an amazing result on one property, but if it's not a process that you can repeat over time, if you're creating that growth and you, and you have to, you have to sell the property, right? Due to, either realizing the growth because you haven't created a portfolio or, you know, what's the, what's the, the passive income situation, you know, if you're not maximizing the cash flow and you have to sell it, 
then you're losing costs on on marketing and agents and capital gains. You're not realizing the the full potential anyway. So you you might get an amazing result on on a single property, but a, an amazing result to create, you know, the kind of lifestyle flexibility that a lot of people want requires more than one property. But we're not saying that you can't, you know, these people are buying multiple properties. These people I'm talking about in Brisbane aren't just buying one property in Brisbane. They're also buying a house in the inner ring of Melbourne. They might have bought a house in Brunswick or Northcote, or they might have bought a house in Yarraville or down towards Hampton, or then they might have gone into Sydney and bought into the real scarce apartment market, or they might have bought a house in, in Sydney. So these people are still buying multiple properties. Um, what kind of income do you need to be able to do that though? That's a, that's a fra- that's the top fraction of of a fraction in Australia. It's very hard for the for the average Australian that's that's you know got a mortgage, going through the interest rate rises, cost of living, to be able to be buying multiple blue chip properties. Your example of Polara, which I said you could pick any property, right? Any mm-hmm. example. Your property Polara, that same person could have made a decision to buy in an ring one of those other locations back in 2018. We are clients. I've got, I've got a prime example. A client buy in Baden for six seventy back in in twenty seventeen or twenty sixteen or something. Okay, so that's twenty percent above what our clients were paying for. Do you know what worries me? I'm actually looking at the map. There's this massive big sticker on there. Basically, says dumping ground right next to Polar. <laughs> Google, Google needs some that? updating. What is that? So that's gone. There's not a dumping ground there anymore. Yeah, it is. <laughs> there's a there's a really small resource center that's a, a recycling place in a shed. Um, there's a there's a there's a school um, just north of, of where that is, closer than uh, than where the available land was. So, yeah, it's it's, uh, it's, a, it's God a love problem. Google, eh? Well, yeah, it's <laughs> funny that there's some people. <laughs> Some people don't even do that much due diligence, but um, you know, that just yeah, the, me up. the DD is a pretty important part. <laughs> it's, it's actually it's almost bigger bigger writing than the actual suburb name, which is quite hilarious. Look, um, I, think, I think we could be here for hours, Michael. We um, yeah, you know, we thanks for coming on. I think it's 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 a good debate. Like we've had two hundred fifty episodes, and not many people are brave enough to come on here and and to talk about the new versus old. I would argue we've got different philosophies. That's all right. Mm-hmm. You, you know, we we want your success in what you do, etc. But ultimately, yeah, yeah, we, we wish you well. Um, I mean, I guess on the uh, property Dumbo side, can you finish us with the story there? I'm sure you've got plenty on. Um... <laughs> I, w- I wish you'd asked me at the start because you're going to make it's going to make uh, it's going to make it sound like I'm giving this deliberately. But um, <laughs> I've been I've been really enjoyed the 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 the, the dialogue, and yeah, it's it's um, like we say, there there are different ways to make money in property, as is a compound growth strategy where you can acquire acquire multiple and. Um, uh, but that's compound property is not compound growth necessarily. <laughs> well, our track records had it and our clients are building portfolios. We've done it. So we'll, we'll stand by it. But um, I will just say to the listeners, really focus on the fundamentals. Don't focus on the headlines, supply, demand, and affordability. Um, because when sentiment changes, you know, the more that those fundamentals line up, the, the quicker the markets markets come back. And we saw that through through COVID. So my Dumbo one is um, uh, a guy I met back in back in 2013. His name was George. Um, couldn't get past his emotions. Bought around the corner from where he lived in uh, Bentley in in Melbourne, which is I guess one of those blue chip suburbs. Um, uh, he bought the property uh, 13 months after he bought it. It needed restumping. Um, couldn't afford to uh, to cover that. Uh, the tenants moved out. And he had to sell it in the market. It wasn't a great time to be selling. So for what he what he bought for six eighty at the time, he sold for six hundred. Um, I guess that story is already always stuck with me around just trying to mitigate your your vacancy uh, your um, maintenance risk because the property was was fifty years old. So that's called um, get a building and pest inspection before you buy. <laughs> well, there we go. Two two, uh, two lessons for uh, for people out of it. So I'd argue though, if if George. Kept his mm-hmm. property. Silly George. Even, even if he paid for his stumping, if he kept a house in Bentley, assume it wasn't on one of the Nepean Highway or no. Um, no, it's it not wasn't on. right on backing onto the train line there at Bentley. No, or it wasn't, it wasn't a, a, a small south facing block with privacy problems, etc. Um, George would have done very well. <laughs> I think that's the point there, Chris. He couldn't afford to keep it because it was it was expensive and and he and he didn't have the buffers in place that were that were substantial buffers in place that were, were required to keep it i think that's exactly the point around why looking affordable is is um you know safer and secure i guess for for more people the the potential risk is lower yeah it's i think george just didn't do it doing his due children like no. that he should have done a building and pest um those those risks can be avoided just through taking your time and watching the market and being patient and persistent yep. 
Um, you know, if, if you're, if you're arguing that yours is a, is a careful strategy that you, um, et cetera, you can also assume that some, um, property investors in the established base are careful and patient and persistent as well. Not all of them are just going out and buying dumps that are going to fall over. Not at all. Um, and so I think George just didn't do his due diligence with a building and pest. If he did. <laughs> Which I think we've spoken about a couple of times, right? Do your DD. It's come up in, <laughs> in three or four times as we've been chatting. Like that, don't be too too quick um, I, uh, yeah good deals will always be good deals so they don't yeah you know, don't have I to think, buy it by by five o'clock today i think uh I, i'm not sure if i mentioned it earlier today with you guys or, or at another call i was on around i am amazed it never ceases to amaze me the amount of people that will buy a property and then within a very short period of time will turn around to sell it for various reasons and that's just basically not having good not having a good plan for starters so george george bummed out and a whole bunch of stuff but i would say I suspect the actual property selection might not have been his worst decision. It's just everything around it might have been a really poor decisions. But one thing I would just mention about the affordability thing, and honestly, aspirational. I, I always like to think aspirational is really a goal for property investors rather than affordable. Affordable is always got downward pressure on price because of that very nature of affordability. Um, whereas aspirational always upward pressure on price because any any time, you know, good areas become perceived to be affordable, the money goes out of the affordable areas into the aspirational areas. Because they think, the minute I think I can buy in that area now, that's where I'm going. Because generally people go to affordable areas because they can't afford something better. And so that's their main motivation. And so I think we always, as investors, have to be very mindful of that, that looking and that it comes back to that scarcity thing. Um that you know that desirability and uh, and upward upward pressure on on uh, in terms of capital growth and even rental income for that that um, that matter, but the that aspirational rather than affordability. I'm going to give credit to Kate Bacos for that one because when we interviewed her way back in the first year, we interviewed Kate and she said that, and I thought, well, oh, that's brilliant. I'm going to latch onto that. So I'm just I'm channeling <laughs> Kate. <laughs> Yeah, and, and look, yeah, d don't definitely don't take affordable. Like we're not talking about three hundred k at the bottom of the market here, you know, right? So it, it's there's there's affordable in terms of you know under the median house price. We don't want cheap because we've got to have you know some intrinsic level of demand. But if there's not demand in an area, you don't see five sixty five to eight thirty in you know three or four years. So. Um, yeah, absolutely. Just because it's brand new, I can't stress enough. Don't be out on the outskirts. You, you've absolutely got to limit the supply. And as I said, supply and demand is the um, uh, overlaid with affordability and sentiments, the dynamic that, that drives growth for sure. Um, yeah, restrict the supply and, and have scarcity. Absolutely. But um, you don't have to sacrifice scarcity to be new at the same time. They're hard to find, but that's, uh, that's, that's, that's our job. Thank you, Michael. I uh, appreciate you being brave enough to come on and tackle the Anytime, elephant. Anytime, guys. It's property. We love talking about it. Um, good, to, uh, good to chat with you both. Thanks for having me on. If you have a question that you'd like us to answer in an upcoming Q&A episode, you can send us a voicemail or written question via the website, theelephantintheroom.com.au, or you can email us directly at questions at theelephantintheroom.com.au. If you like what you're hearing, please share this episode with others you feel would benefit. And while you're at it, why not leave us an iTunes review? Five stars would be great. I know that sounds a bit cringy, but we have it on good authority that every review helps make it easier for other people to find out about us and hear what our amazing guests have to say.